walks on water. And I thought, you know what, I'm just going to skip that story because I've alluded to it a couple other messages and because I actually preached a, a big message strictly on that story already. And I thought, you know what, I don't want to repeat myself and everyone's laughing already because I repeat myself all the time. But, but, but a whole other message. And so I said to Heather, you know, I felt like I should preach this message. Um, and so I said to Heather, I said, Heather, like, remember, you know, I already preached, if, you know, get out of the boat and... And uh, actually, was, I was on the phone, and she said, Rick, um, that was in 2007. Um, and so I guess, uh, to me, it seems fresh in my life, because I live my life very much through this story about this idea about getting out of the boat. Uh, but it was 11 years ago when I preached this message. So it's not the same message. Uh, I wish it would be, but I couldn't find it on my computer, so I had to do all the work again. Uh, <laughs> but uh, no, it's uh, life changes, and we grow, and we learn, and and I thought it was super fitting because I preached this message uh, 11 years ago as I was getting ready to take a huge step of faith and we were selling our possessions. We were, we were actually living in my mom's garage, my mom and dad's garage at the time. And uh, we were going to preach this message about how God wants us to take a step of faith to get out there, to be bold, to get out of the boat. And, and it's fitting that now I'm back here. But actually, for those of you who are at our AGM on Monday, you will realize that as a church, we're taking some steps of faith. Uh, and as a church, we have people in our church who are taking steps of faith. And so we're going to reannounce something because there are a lot more people here than we're at our AGM. But as a church, we've been talking about family. As a church, we've been talking about discipleship. We've been talking about how everybody needs to have somebody that they can go to, that they can connect with, that they can be an example for, that they can love, that they can care for. And, and, and last week we talked about the importance of being family. And if you see a need, you've got to meet that need. And one of the things I mentioned before we started that message last week was that that also applies to leadership. And we weren't talking about leadership, but it applies to leadership. And so as leadership, uh, for many, many months, we've been, for several months at least, we've been praying, God, how can we make this place more of a place of discipleship? How can we facilitate this church to be a place of family, a place where everybody who has needs, who, who's lonely, who needs help, who needs to connect, how can we facilitate that? And, and the Holy Spirit put something on our hearts and on our minds, and that was that we should pursue having a discipleship or mentorship pastoral couple. So, uh, people who would go out and they would connect with people one-on-one, -on -one. they would help people uh, find people that they could disciple. And remember we talked last week that when you see a problem in the church, instead of simply complaining, it's important to fix it. It's important to come up with a solution, but often we don't come up with solutions because we feel like we might be left high and dry being having to do the work all by ourselves. And so as a church, we felt like a discipleship couple would be a great, great, a great couple that could connect with people who had a dream to see, improve, see things change in the church and they could help them and, and to mentor them through that and to help the marriages that are struggling, and, and help the people who are hurting. And so, for those who weren't there on Monday, we announced that, that we, are, we will be taking on a pastoral couple for discipleship and mentorship, and we, we, we as an elder board felt the Holy Spirit led us to Lauren and Wanda Bell. And so Lauren and Wanda Bell are going to be, be starting working at the church. Wanda's going to be starting, I believe, March 5th or 6th. And, and Lauren has had to take a huge step of faith and go to, the, to, the, to his boss and say, look, um, I had a, I'm going to say it's a better offer. Uh, it might not pay quite as much, but it's a better offer because it's, it's working with me. Um, and you guys, of course. Um, no, but, but, but they've taken a huge step of faith in doing that. And and quitting their jobs and getting ready to serve you guys in this church. And so how fitting is it that today we talk about getting out of the boat. We talk about expecting miracles in our lives as we are faithful. And so I am very excited for all those who are excited for the church and for the steps of faith we have taken. Where is Lauren? Lauren's in the back. Wanda's here. I'm going to make you stand up, Wanda. We're not, on, on Monday we, we, we all surrounded them and prayed for them and you guys can do that later on during prayer time. But Wanda, Lord, let's give a great big hand. How awesome is it? How incredibly blessed are we that they were willing to take that incredible step of faith? 
And like I said, this message was first, I first spoke on this message just before I had to do the same sort of thing in my life, quit my job, move in with my parents, and hopefully that won't happen to you guys. Um, move in with my parents. <laughs> and uh, get ready for Africa. And so this morning we're going to talk about the story about Jesus walking on water. And so that's from Matthew chapter 14, 22 to 33. And I'm going to read that for you this morning, uh, the whole story. Uh, before we do that, I, I'm just going to give you some background. This is right after a couple, couple weeks ago, we talked about, or almost a month ago, we talked about compassion, how Jesus was moved by compassion and he fed the 5,000. And so Jesus feeds the 5,000 people. He's moved by compassion. He feeds 5,000 people. And immediately afterwards, like we're talking, this is, he's fed the 5,000, and this is what Jesus says immediately afterwards. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of them to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land. Buffeted by the waves because of the wind, because the wind was against it, shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. This was not Canada. Uh, it's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it is you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got, got down out of the boat, walked on water, and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was, terif he was afraid, and beginning, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Now, first of all, I love this, because here's Peter. Okay, so just, just let's set the stage, really, for a, minute, for a moment. First of all, I took a look. I went back. Anything before this story, what are some of the things the disciples have already seen Jesus do? Okay, so he cured leprosy. The lame and the paralyzed were able to walk again. He healed a lady who had a fever, which doesn't seem like a big thing after you make the lame walk again. He cast out demons. He calmed a storm. The mute were healed and able to speak. The dead had already been raised to life, and the blind could see. And the evening before this story, he fed 5,000 people with a picnic basket with some fish and some bread. Okay, and so, now Jesus comes walking on the water, they're terrified. It doesn't, it still doesn't make sense to them. And a whole bunch of men who would eventually be the, fa the, the, the fathers of the early church are sitting there. Men who have seen all this incredible work. And only one of them has the courage to say, hey, wait a minute. That's something we can do? Jesus, if it's really you... Let me walk on water. And sure, halfway through he failed. And Jesus said, oh, you of little faith. But what about the men who were left in the boat? I mean, they didn't, they didn't get told they had little faith, I guess, but they also never got to walk on water. And I just, as I read this story, I just think it's an incredible challenge for all of us is that, is that yeah, sometimes we fail, sometimes we make a mistake, but I want, I want to be somebody who walks on water and, and not Canadian water, you know? I want to be able to walk on regular water that's got waves, something that I can be afraid of. And so I wrote, I wrote down there on, on this slide, it says, the boat was full of men who would be the founders of the early church. It was full of men who would see people healed and miracles happen through their prayers. And, and, and I forgot to correct it here, but it says, yet only Peter walked on water. If you want to walk on water... You have to get out of the boat. And I, I, this is a story I've told, I've told this story multiple times, uh, but when we were going to go to Africa, I preached that message. Before, it was months before we left, uh, and Heather was still terrified, and she wasn't quite sure this is where we should be, what we should be doing. She knew it, but she didn't. And uh, 
And it was so incredible because I preached this message, get out of the boat. And I guess, because now I always do look at her when I preach, but um, she thought, man, he, he actually made this message just for me because he wants me to get out of my boat. And he's just trying to use where, where she can't complain, right? Because when I'm up here, it's hard to complain. And so she thought I was using this as my pedestal to scold my wife that she needed to get out of the boat, which was not what was going on. Uh, and then and we went home and, and uh, she picked up a book. And somebody gave her a book, said, ah, you could re read this book. And it was something along the lines of, get out of the boat. And, uh, and then she listened to some music, and uh, it said, uh, if you ask me to get out of my boat into the crushing waves, that's where I'm going to go or something. And it was, get out of the boat. And, and she even swears to this day, as she was watching TV, she was flicking through the channels and got to, to like Seinfeld, I think it was, and Kramer opens the door and yells, get out of the boat now. Now, we know that there's no way that happened. You could go through all the scripts that's never been there, but, but she swears that happened. Um, and I'm so glad it did. But I want to tell you something. We went, and we got out of our boat. We sold everything we had, and, and I, could, I could literally talk for hours about the incredible times that God came through for us, where people would walk up to us and say, Hey, I hear you're going to Africa. Yeah. And we had some personal debt, and we promised that we would never raise funds for personal debt. You get yourself into trouble, get yourself out of trouble. That's how I was raised. Don't, 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 don't raise money for personal debt. And, and somebody came up to me and said, I'd like to give you a donation. I said, okay, uh, here's how you do it. And they said, no, I want to give it to you personally. And I said, oh, sorry, we're not taking personal money. Um, we're not asking for money for ourselves. I said, you don't have to ask. God told us to give this to you. And, and and over and over and over again, people came up to us specifically saying, this is what God wants. And, and, and we sold all our possessions. And with that, I think when we sold everything, we had a great big auction at the church. And we owed about 1600 bucks, I think it was. And then one day somebody comes up to us and they give us $800. And within a day from then, somebody else gave us another $800. Both of them said, this is for your personal expenses, your personal stuff. And we, to the penny, God came through for us. No, that still brought us back to zero dollars. God didn't make me a millionaire. But I'll tell you something. It's incredible how faithful our God can be. You know, as we talk about getting out of the boat, I'm going to share another story that I've shared with you before. An actual, literal, real-life get-out-of-the-boat story where he actually told me to get out of an actual boat. Okay, and so some of you will remember this story. I've told it before. But we, we get to Africa. I get out of my boat to get to Africa. He provides all my needs. I've had some of the most incredible life experiences that I could ever have dreamed of. Um, I've got to hunt in Africa. I've got to see so, so many incredible things. I've just had some awesome experiences. But there was one time in our ministry where in the span of one week, two children coming to school, that we run the school, the two children coming to school were, were, were killed by crocodiles. Uh, about, about 150 of our students have to cross a river to get to school, and two of them in a week were killed by crocodiles, and most of you know this story. But in, the, in that moment, what they really needed in Africa in that exact moment wasn't a preacher, wasn't a missionary, was simply a redneck. And guess what? They had one. And so, so here I go, and I go, and I make a trap. And, uh, and I've told you this before, but imagine you had a gas can, 20 liter gas can that you sealed off uh, like a big buoy. And I, if you don't know, I, I'm getting to be a pretty, I'm getting heavier than I'd like, but, but a two, 20 liter gas can, I can basically lay on that thing and I won't go under the water at all. And so I tied a cable to it, took some rebar, made a great big fish hook, shoved a cow heart on there, and the, the, the idea is Croc eats the, the bait, gets it inside of him, and he can't dive because the, the buoy's there, but he tires himself out without snapping the cable. Anyways, don't want to get too long here, but I get a phone call. I get a message, Pastor, get here quickly. You got a crocodile. And they, they were panicking because they could see this, 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 this canister just zipping back and forth in this pond. And so the pond was not even as wide as this, and definitely it was about half the width of the, of the gym and just under the length. And at either end there were rapids, and so people were standing at those rapids and those rapids, and so we knew the crocodile was in here, and we knew the buoy was moving, and I arrived. And there it is. That 20-liter that buoy is about an inch out of the water is all. That thing is sucked right down. This thing could pull down, which means almost 200 pounds worth of pressure pulling down. And, uh, and so I get out to that, that, that buoy, and I'm pulling, and I'm pulling, and I'm pulling. I tie a rope on it. We cannot get this thing free. And I'm like, that croc, that that crocodile had to find a tree under that thing. 
and he went under a tree, and there's no way I'm going to get him out. And so I tell the people, I say, okay, guys, um, this is stupid. There's no way we can pull this thing out. Let's just cut the cable. We'll try again. We'll make a shorter cable next time. And uh, no, nope, nope, that's not going to work. Now we have wounded crocodiles, Rick. Like, this is your fault now, you know. We're going to have to fix this. I said, there's nothing I can do. And uh, they looked at me, and because of their culture, believing that the crocodiles were controlled by evil spirits, they looked at me and said, don't worry. We know you are afraid. It's reasonable to be afraid. We will get the witch doctor to, to bless the river, and, uh, and then you can, you can go get your crocodile. And in that moment, I, I, had a, I had a moral dilemma, but I also had a conviction. We talk about the Holy Spirit giving us a conviction. And the conviction that the Holy Spirit gave me was, Rick, it's time for you to get out of the boat. And I, uh, no, I ain't getting out of the boat. That thing just pulled down almost 200 pounds worth of pressure. Even if I, It might be, not be a big crocodile, but I do not have 200 pounds worth of power in me to keep myself afloat. And I felt the Holy Spirit lay on my heart, you got to get out of the boat. And so I paddled over to Heather because I knew, I knew she would fight the Holy Spirit on this one. And so I paddle up to Heather. I say, Heather, I think I have to get into the, in, into the water. And she said, okay. <laughs> I'm like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? You're supposed to be on my side here. And so, and so I paddle back to the middle. I tell the guys, okay, guys, I'm only going to do, because they said, you're the missionary. God will protect you. I said, but do you believe he'll protect you? So I made one of them come in with me. But you can see, well, let's go to the, you can see in that picture, he's not leaving the boat, eh? He's, he, that crocodile, that crocodile needs to believe he's part of, he's a motor on that boat, right? So he holds on to the boat, and, and I go swimming. And, and so we go swimming, and I got to pull myself down to this crocodile. And the men on the shore have all, they've all kind of made, made bets as to who's going to take care of my wife uh, when I die. They actually told me, they actually appointed, true story, they actually appointed somebody. Pastor, if you die, so-and-so is going to care for your family. Don't worry. We got you. I had a great big prayer time, and it was chanting, and it was all this, they were praying for me on the edge of the shore. Anyways, I swim down, and I try and get this crocodile, and I, and I pull my, it's muddy, and I, I reach down, and I pull myself hand over hand, get to the log, and I, at one point, I thought I had a crocodile in my hand. It turned out to be the heart of the cow that I had there, which didn't make me any more peace because that meant the crocodile wasn't on my fish hook anymore. <laughs> and, uh, and I knew that in that tiny little pond that was less than the width of this and about half the distance, um, we already knew people had been standing at that rapids and that rapids. There was no way this crocodile had left this pond. And so here I am swimming with a crocodile trying to find where he is to kill him. Um, and it was amazing because God kept me alive. Uh, and, and we knew these crocodiles would attack children. We also knew, we just recently talked to a lady who had a, a shattered arm uh, because she was washing, she was not even in the water, she was washing her stuff, and this crocodile came out and grabbed her, just a little one, it was six or seven feet long, uh, but it actually almost dragged her in and shattered her, her, her arm. We knew that a, a man swimming had no chance even against a small crocodile, but when God says, get out of the boat, you get out of the boat. When God says, put it all on the line, you put it all on the line. And it was amazing. Just a few days later, we get another crocodile. And he crawls into a cave. You can see the cave down there. He crawls into that cave. It's not very big. It gets smaller as you go in. My beard's all covered in mud, and my head's all covered in mud. And I'm army crawling into there, just scraping my back as I'm going. And big 16-foot piece of rebar. And uh, I get all the way into that cave, and I'm looking at that crocodile, and he's looking at me. And... And we're going, what are we going to do? God said, get out of the boat. So, buddy, you're done. And I remember, and you've heard, I know you've heard the story, but I remember taking that spear above my head because you don't have no power above your head when you're laying on the ground and trying to jab this crocodile with this spear. And uh, un, I didn't realize how the noise that crocodiles made when they didn't want to be stabbed with a spear. Um, and I have him pinned into the back of the cave with my spear, and he's screaming, Rah! and the people outside, you can ask Heather, their eyes are about like this big. Because they think there's some evil spirit coming to try and attack their, their, their pastor in the, in, in the thing. And eventually we get the spear through him and we pull it out and kill the crocodile with a hammer. Um, and uh, yeah, I screamed like a little girl, jumped on that crocodile and just... Ah! And also true story. And eventually, it's so funny because eventually I stopped when Heather, when Heather said, Rick, I can hear the rocks. Uh, because I'd gotten right through. You know, I just kept hitting it until I was hearing rocks on the other side. Um, but it was incredible because from that day forward, I was able to sit down with these guys 
and, I, and we have the crocodile, and I said, guess what, guys? When God says, get out of the boat, you get out of the boat. And I told them the story about Moses with the, with the snakes and the, how the, you know, God, God had the power over the, over the witch doctors of their time. And they didn't have to worry about it. And it reminds me of the story of Daniel and the lion's den, except this is the crocodile pond. And, and it was incredible because in my life I have found something to be true every single time. When God tells me to get out of my boat, I've got one option. And that's to get out of my boat. And now I could have stayed in my boat, but I wouldn't have had the thrill that I had. I wouldn't have had that knowledge about how God comes through for me. I could have stayed in my boat and not went to Africa, but I would have missed out on some of the most incredible times in my life. I would have missed out on leading so many people into a love and a joy and a peace that only God can give them. People who lived in fear from the witch doctrine, from the evil spirits, were set free. And I only was able to experience that when I was willing to get to a point in my life that said, I am going to get out of my boat. That boat was filled with disciples, but only one of them experienced the miracle. You know, I was, I was thinking about it. All the miracles that the other disciples had experienced, I, I'm going to call them passive miracles. And what I mean by that is, is that the, the person raised from the dead wasn't them. They kind of saw the miracle. Even the feeding of the 5,000, sure, they got to eat the food, but they had the picnic basket to start off with anyways. You know, everybody else got to experience all these miracles, and they watched them. But Peter got to be part of an active miracle. Peter got to be part of an active miracle because he was willing to get out of the boat. I sat down this week and I said, what are the things that keep us from experiencing the miracles that God has for in our lives? And there are two things, there, there are two problems, and they're kind of related. They're almost exactly the same, actually. And that is the first thing that keeps us from getting out of our boat is doubt. Doubt. We are unsure that God will do what he says he will do. We do not trust his love. We do not trust his care. And we do not trust his power. We do not have enough faith to get out of the boat. Oh yeah, we all want to believe in a miracle. We all want to pray for a miracle. We just want to believe and we want to pray without having the risk of drowning. We want to believe and we want to pray without having the risk of being eaten by crocodiles. We want to believe and we want to pray like Daniel without the risk of being thrown into, into a lion's den or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego without the risk of being thrown into a fiery furnace. Or we want to believe, but we don't want to be like David and stand before the giants. Yeah, it's easy to want to believe. It's easy to pray for a miracle. Those are the easy things. But as we learn to hear the voice of God, we need to recognize that he's probably going to tell you to get out of the boat. He's probably going to tell you to face the giant. He's probably going to tell you to get ready to enter into the fire. Because that's when the miracles happen. God can't save you from the fire that you don't get thrown into. God can't save you from the ocean that you don't enter into. And so the second thing, which is basically, which is basically a parallel to, to doubt, and that is fear. We are afraid that if God does not come through, we will drown. You see, we want to believe. We've got this tiny little faith, and we want to grow the faith. But the only way to grow the faith is to risk drowning. It's the same thing with skydiving. You can believe that the chute is open. You can believe it's going to open. But the only way to grow your faith in that parachute is to risk plummeting to your death. Yeah, you can stay on the thing and say, well, I'm just going to pull the rope. Oh, yeah, it popped out. Okay, I trust it. But you can guarantee when they repack it, you're like, I wonder if they repacked it right. I wonder if they repacked it right. Like, I know it worked on the ground, but what if they repacked it? What if they knotted it up when they were repackaging it? You see, the only way to experience the, the reward that comes with skydiving is to jump out of the plane. The only way to walk on water is to get out of the boat. And we have to recognize that in order to do it, we're going to have to do something. There is something on you because very rarely does God push us out of the plane. Oh, he'll get us to the door. He might even nudge us a little bit. <laughs> but he expects you to jump. It's funny that Jesus didn't actually call the disciples to get out of the boat. You ever notice that when you read the story? He, didn't, he wasn't walking on water and said, hey guys. Come to me. He waited. He waited for the one who wanted the miracle. And that's the other thing that we do. 
I better get back to my notes. That's the other thing that we do all the time when we talk to God. God, I'm waiting for you to tell me when I should get out of the boat. But Peter didn't wait. He just simply said, I want to get out of the boat. I want to do this. Jesus, let me do this. And then he, all he did was he waited for the affirmation. He waited for God on the timing. But he was ready for the miracle the whole way through. So what is God's response to our doubt? What is God's response to our fear and our lack of faith? Well, I could give you a hundred verses. I simply just chose one. Matthew 6, 28 to 24. And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough troubles of its own. You know what's so funny? When I set that trap, I didn't worry about what tomorrow would hold. <laughs> tomorrow had enough troubles of its own. When I went into that water, I didn't worry about what tomorrow would hold because I had enough problems right in front of me. To seek ye first the kingdom. Seek first what God wants for you. Don't worry first about how, how you're going to do this and how you're going to do that. But first, pursue God in everything that you do. And as you do those things, God is going to bless you incredibly. And so this morning, there are three areas in our lives that we tend to not trust in God. There are three seas that we tend not to walk on. There are three planes that we tend not to jump out of. And the first one, and I'm picking on it because it's the biggest in everybody's life, the first one is money. I'd like to think I have a sea of money to worry about, but I don't. And that's why I worry about money. Many people fall, fail to experience, many people fail to experience all that God has for them because we are afraid God won't take care of us if we are generous or if following Him costs us our job or our finances or our income. Or maybe God calls you to, to do something that seems extreme. And you know it is God, but you are afraid. What if God doesn't come through for me? What if I drown and i got to declare bankruptcy? What if this doesn't happen the way I wanted it to happen? I'll tell you something. As a missionary, I've met many, many, many missionaries. And you would be surprised how many missionaries sell everything they have. They come into the field and two or three years later... They end up going home for one reason or another, having to start over again. And imagine if they had been afraid to go in the first place. Because most of those missionaries, often they'll go home discouraged and frustrated, but the reality is, is even after they leave, I hear the incredible stories of what they did while they were there. And they may leave discouraged, they may leave in despair, they may leave feeling like failures, but they have planted seeds that last forever. And it only happens because they were willing to fail. And some of them succeeded and some of them failed, but even those who felt like they were failures, most of them didn't realize the incredible successes that they truly were. And I can't imagine what it would be like to allow the fear of money to destroy the plan that God has for you. God has called us to be generous in our giving. Be faithful to those in need. And when we are not, when we put our own needs above the needs of other people, what ends up happening is we fail to experience a miracle. We sit in the boat and we praise the people going into the mission field, or we praise the people fe feeding the hungry. We look at the Peters and we go, man, how cool is that? And we never, ever walk on water in our own lives. We live our entire lives admiring the miracles that others receive. And I believe that's part of the biggest problem in our world, 
is that we spend so much time admiring and, and praising the miracles, we build our faith on the miracles that other people experience. But imagine if you could build your faith on the miracles that you experienced. If you could build your faith on that when God tells you to go into a new business and you do it. When God tells you to, to go into the mission field and you do it. When God tells you to give generously and you do it. Those are the times when you experience the incredible power of God in your life. Matthew chapter 6, 24. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. You know, there's a lot of people in this world who say money is the root of all evil, and that's not what the Bible says. The Bible actually says love. The love of money. Money is a great tool. But when we worship it, and you worship something, this is just, this is, I want you to hear this. You know you are worshiping money when you would rather have it than feed the hungry. You know you are worshiping, you might say, I don't worship money. If you don't worship money, you're going to put God's call higher than your, your, your bank account. It means you're going to feed the hungry. You're going to help people who are hurting. You're going to give when, when, when giving is needed. Do you know, I actually have a dream even for this church. And I, I've never shared this dream. I haven't even shared this dream with our elders. But I, I, it's a dream that I have for this church. I, 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 I feel like I would love to, as a church, be able to say that 25% of what comes in, a minimum of 25% that I could, we could clearly say, it goes to reaching the lost. It goes to missions. It goes to changing the world. It goes to feeding the hungry. That we could clearly say that 25% because people believe in it and people give generously and people give faithfully so that we can be a church that everywhere around Grunthal people know that Abundant Life Fellowship is a place where we put our money where our mouth is. Because I believe that God wants us to be faithful. And I want to tell you something the else that I have noticed, actually, well, let's read the next verse, and I'm going to, I'll add to it from there. 2 Corinthians 9, verses 6 to 9. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or out of compulsion, not because the pastor's telling you to give, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gift to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Do you know what I find incredible about this? You know, I read, I listened to a story the other day. This guy said, oh, just sow your seed of faith. It, it drove me nuts. He was asking people to give him a ton of money is what he was doing. Um, and I listened to this guy, he's like, if you owe a thousand dollars on your credit card, give a thousand dollars to me and, and God will bless you and you'll pay off your debt. That's not what this is talking about. That's the, so if you think that's what this is talking about, that's not what it's talking about because you'll read something later on. It says, it says, you will abound in every good work. See, that's the kicker there that God will bless you abundantly in what really matters that when we are faithful when we are faithful in what we do, God will bless us abundantly. He will give us what we're really seeking. He will give us abundant love, abundant joy, abundant peace, abundance of patience, so that every good work might be accomplished. You see, his give, He gives back far more than you give. He gives back a spiritual reward that is incredible. And it's not because of your money. You do not buy God's blessing. It is simply showing God the condition of your heart. So I want to be very careful with that. That doesn't sound like you're buying God's blessing. That's not, how, that's not how God works. God simply wants to know that you love Him and you love the people around you. My children wanted to play with their tablets the other day. We, we had little tablets. They played little games on them. And, and, uh, and, and I said, no. And they said, why not? I said, because you didn't do the dishes. Well, I shouldn't have to do the dishes. I did the dishes yesterday. Uh, and, and, and so sometimes when we look at that sowing and reaping, what we think is, oh, I'll sow money, I'll get money. Okay, my kids don't, it's not my kids don't sow doing the dishes and then they get more dishes. Well, they do get more dishes, so maybe it is. But, uh, but the reward isn't always a direct parallel to what they did. 
And God wants to see our faithfulness. When my kids have a bad attitude about something else, there's a consequence in this area of their lives. And sometimes we don't have the love and the joy and the peace because we haven't been faithful to God in the other things. And as much as it's uncomfortable to hear a pastor say that finances are sometimes those things. But finances aren't the only storm, aren't the only sea that keep us from being faithful to God. Relationships can keep us from being faithful to God. The fear of of broken relationships, the fear of not being popular, the fear of not fitting in. And so if you're a young person, you might want to leave. Don't, please, but I'm saying, because I'm going to say some uncomfortable things this morning about what it means to walk on water, what it means to get out of your boat and be faithful in everything when it comes to relationships. It is easy to let fear keep us from sharing our faith or doing what is right. How many people compromise what they believe to make somebody else happy? And so I'm going to pick on a couple topics this morning that make people terribly uncomfortable. One of them is going to be drinking. And again, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with drinking at all. It's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying, what are you known for? I look at so many young people in our world today, even young people in our church today. And not just young people, it's older people too, but, but some of us are known more for our drinking than for our faith in God. Some of us are known more for our drinking than our faith in God. Some of us are known more for our time at, our, at, the, at the bar than we're known for our time at, at, at church. Some of us enjoy our time at the bar more than we enjoy our time at the church. Or with other believers. Some of us, what we do is we quickly find other believers to go to the bar with simply so that we can have confidence knowing that we're not the only one going to the bar. And again, I'm not saying that you're wrong. What I'm saying is that you are wrong if you are known for something else more than you are known for your relationship with Jesus Christ. Because what Jesus Christ wants for for you is that every single person who knows you to know your love of Jesus. And if people know you for something other than your love of Jesus more than that, then you have a problem. You see, in every place people go, well, are you saying it's wrong to drink? No, it's not what I'm saying. I'm saying it's wrong to be known. It's wrong to, to be known as that person. If I were to look at your Facebook, if I were to look at your Facebook, it is wrong for me. I'm, I'm going to put it right out there. I'm going to be bold today. It is wrong for me to look at your Facebook and know you for your party life more than I know you for your spiritual life. And and if that's who you are, you might love God, but you're missing out on something that God has for you because he wants you to get out of your boat. And if you do not have the boldness, if you do not have the courage to get out of your boat, then you have a problem. And it's great to have a relationship with God. It's great to show up on a Sunday morning. But if that's not what you're, if you're not known for your love of God, you've got a problem. I'll tell you something. I want to be known for my love of God. And I've told you this story before, but, but like I said, this is not a statement on, on alcohol this morning. When I worked at the lodge, that's how I paid for Bible school. I worked at the lodge, and every weekend the guys would go out partying. And I remember all the conversations that I had with my friends about Jesus. You see, and that's not bragging, it just happens to be that that, that, that that was an area that I didn't struggle with. And so I would be with them. And, and the next day as they are recovering from their hangovers, they're saying, boy, how can you have so much joy and peace in your life? It's because I'm not worried about what you think. I don't care if you make fun of me for my chocolate milk. Because I am more than what I drink. I am more than that. And when we are known for the things of this world, we have a problem. And I am so encouraged by looking at King David. And again, it's a story I've shared about King David. They go and they retake the Ark of the Covenant. It's been stolen from them. And they retake it. It's got the commandments in it. And it's got, I believe it's got Aaron's staff in it. There's a whole bunch of things in it. It's got in these, these tokens. And they come back. And, and as they're singing and they're dancing and they're celebrating, one of the things that they would often do is tear off their clothes. It was just a thing of the day, and I'm not going to get into it. Please, let's not do that this Sunday morning when you're super excited. Uh, and so here David is, and just, to, just picture this guy. They had these great big tunics, and under that there'd be a bit of kind of a loincloth sort of thing. And he, so you don't just take off your shirt. You, it's, it's a wrap. It's just, yeah. It's, and he's, he's basically torn this thing off. He's like, yeah, victory. We have, 
We have the Ten Commandments back. We have the symbol of God's presence in our midst again. And he is singing and he is dancing and he is shouting and they're just hooting and hollering. And, 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 and so Saul, so the previous king, Saul's daughter, who is now married to, to David, she's looking out the window and she's just like, oh, my word. Oh, my word. Who did I marry? Yes. Yeah. Oh, my word. Oh, my word. And so, and so she gives him a hard time. That's, my wife doesn't give me a hard time, though, because she's so, so patient. Um, but, but she gives him a hard time, and she says, How dare you? How dare you make yourself into a fool celebrating these Ten Commandments coming back? You looked, this is a paraphrase, you looked like an idiot. How do you expect anybody to respect you when you get so incredibly nutty just because we bring back this Ark of the Covenant. And here is David's response. David said to Michal, It was before the Lord who chose me, rather than your father or anyone from his house, when he appointed me ruler of the Lord's people, Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this. And I will be humiliated in my own eyes. But by these slave girls you spoke of, I will be held in honor. I will dance. I will sing. To be mad for my king. Nothing, Lord, is hindering this passion in my soul. <laughs> I love that song. And I, it's good, I, I sing it every time while I play hockey. I was actually playing with, <laughs> I was joking with Chris. Chris Reimer, this week, I played against him this week, and he says, what song are you singing today, Rick? And so I'm, I'm there on defense. I will dance, I will sing to be mad. I want the world to know that I love Jesus. And whether that means, whether that means somebody sees me in the bar praying with somebody, celebrating Jesus, whether that means somebody sees me while everyone else is swearing and fighting, saying, man, God is good. I'm having a good time. I don't care what it is, I'm not going to put my relationship with others before my relationship with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords because He's the only one who's ever been able to give me a joy that passes all understanding. He's the only one, may, it's through Him that I have peace that nobody else can fathom. It's through Him that when life gives me stress, I can overcome it. When people hurt me, I can forgive them. It is only through Him. And when I, when I turn my back on Him and in my relationship with other people. Because I want to tell you something as boldly as I can. If you are not known for that, you are simply turning your back on Him. You do not care. He is not the love of your life. It is very much like me if I am flirting with other women and I don't tell them that I'm married. Do you know what happens? I, I sleep on the couch if I can get through the front door. That's what happens. And we, but, but to God, to God, somehow we think it's acceptable that people don't know that we're connected to God. That He is, he, you know, the Bible says, lover of our soul. Somehow we don't care. And then we wonder why we don't get the rewards that come with a marriage to Jesus Christ, with the marriage to God. We wonder why we don't get the benefits. And yet, we're flirting with all these other things. We don't even want people to know. We're ashamed if people know that we love Jesus. If you want to experience all that God has for you, if you want to walk on water, get out of the boat. Because God has a plan for you. I'm way off my notes. I'm going to skip a couple points here. Relationships. The final storm the final C that we have to overcome is the fear of failure. How many people don't get out of the boat simply because they're afraid of drowning? How many people don't start that new job because they're afraid that it won't work out? How many people don't go into missions because they're afraid it might not work out? Don't sell their possessions. How many people don't give because they're afraid that it don't work out. We are afraid that we're going to take a step of faith or that we will publicly announce something and it's not going to work out. I get it. I totally get it. 
I don't want to tell everybody something awesome is coming down the pipes and then not have something awesome come and look like I'm a fool. But you know what's incredibly interesting? Peter is the only one who walked on water. He's also the only one who failed at doing it. Oh yeah, the other ones didn't fail at walking on water. They simply just didn't get out of the boat. But Peter walked on water. He did the impossible and then he failed. Do you know what? Does anybody care? Do you think his grandkids care? Oh yeah, but you sank after a little while, Gramps. You sank. He's like, yeah. have you walked on water? Boy, have you walked on water? Do you know what? It's okay to fail. Failure's a part of life. See, that's what God says. He said, I'll get you through the failures. I'll get you through the hard times. But we know that in all things, God works together for the good of those who love him. He doesn't say all things are going to be good. He doesn't say you're not going to fail. Peter was the biggest failure that we read about in the New Testament. He failed walking on water. He, he cut off some guy's ear. Okay, just like, love your enemy. Love your enemy. Love your enemy. The first time an enemy comes, the very first time an enemy comes, what does he do? Grabs his sword, cop, c- chops off the guy's ear. You're like, dude, have you not listened to anything? A couple hours later, he denies Jesus three times. Like, seriously, biggest failure. And so Jesus takes Peter aside. He says, upon you, I will build my church. Because he'd far sooner build his church on a moving failure than on a sitting dead rock. He would far sooner build his church. He would far sooner do miracles with a failure who's willing to get out of the boat than somebody who's too afraid to do in the first place. It's easy not to fail if you just sit on your butt. But the fear of failure is what is going to keep us from greatness. Because we need to say, God, I believe in you. God, I trust in you. God, I will give you everything. God, I love you. I want everybody to know it. I will sell all I have to the poor. If that's what i got to do, I will be obedient and I will listen. The fear of failure in all of these circumstances that I mentioned this morning. David, the entire people of Israel were afraid that giant would kill them. The only reason... The only reason David got to experience a miracle is because everybody else was sitting on their butts. The only reason he got that miracle is because everybody else sat on their butts. God God came to Gideon and said, okay, you're going to go, you're going to experience a miracle. It only worked because when they went to the river and he separated, then later on he said, who's afraid? Gideon said, who's afraid? And everybody else runs away. Half Half the army runs away. He's like, there we go. Now God's got room to work. I had to get rid of some of you because too many of you were standing around. We wouldn't believe God was doing any work here. Get rid of some of you. God actually told us, you know, some of you aren't ready for a miracle. But you want a miracle. Stop being afraid of failure. Because the greatest, the greatest mover and shaker in the early church was Peter. The guy who almost drowned when he walked on water. The guy who chopped off some dude's ear and denied Jesus three times. I want to tell you something. I, it's okay to fail. It's okay to say, I think God's leading me in this direction and get to this direction and say, whoops, maybe God was leading me in this direction. Do you know why? Because the people who never seek where God is leading them, yeah, they never, they never make the mistake. But we learn to hear God's voice by making a mistake. We learn to hear God's direction by making a mistake. If you've never been wrong, you've probably rarely are right. If you've never been wrong, you're probably rarely right. And you know what they say? I think it's that... Uh, I think it's with WD-40, you know. It took, took more than one try. Closer to 40, you know. The light bulb wasn't done in a day. It wasn't, wasn't one try. I think it was like a thousand tries or something. It's, it's amazing. The greatest successes in this world come from the biggest failures. Embrace being a failure. Because being a failure means you're trying. Being a failure means you're listening. Being a failure means you're pursuing something. Because I, I, I would far sooner be known as a failure who did something great than just fade into time as someone who sat on my butt doing absolutely nothing. So I'm going to invite the worship team to come forward now. We're going to go to a time of prayer. Whatever your storm, whatever your storm may be, you need to ask God to let you walk on water. You need to begin to Trust in God. You need to be willing to leave your comfort zone because it is only in conquering fear and doubt that we can fully know the power 
and miracles of God. I believe that God has some great things. Actually, I don't know if they're here this morning. Is Ovaldo and Margaret here this morning? They're not here this morning. Okay, I'm going to point them out next week anyways because I use them as a sermon illustration. I didn't ask. Um, Ovaldo and Margaret, some of you don't know them. They're an awesome couple. They're actually taking a step of faith this year. You know, he works. He's, he's on the board of Simon House Bible Camp. Uh, he's, he's, he's incredibly faithful. Works at the drop-in center. She works at Awana. They're incredibly faithful. They're always getting out of their boat. They're always listening for God to give them another, another direction. And, and uh, I, I visited with them at Mission Fest this, last, this year, just a couple weeks ago. They're going to Germany to do missions. There's a mission in Germany that, that, that's reaching out. And they're selling all that they have to take a step of faith. And I believe God's going to do great things. And we don't know if it's going to work out. We don't know if it's going to be one year or six months or ten years. But it doesn't matter. Because God is faithful every time we get out of the boat. And we might walk across the entire sea. Or we might start sinking in ten steps. But we've got to trust in God. And if you need God to do something in your life this morning, I want to challenge you to bring it to time of prayer. If you need to be able to forgive somebody, but you've been too afraid to approach them and talk about it, if you've got a burden in your life, if you feel like God's directing you somewhere, you've been too afraid to deal with it, if there's a relational thing in your life that you need to talk to, do it this morning. Trust that God is going to get you through, whether it's a success or whether it's a failure. God is going to let you walk on water. So if you want to walk on water this morning, get out of the boat. God, I love you. You are so incredible. I'm so thankful for the miracles you've given me. I'm thankful for how every time I've gotten out of the boat, you have helped me. You maybe haven't made me a millionaire that I would like. Maybe I still have debt. But boy, my life is so full. I wouldn't trade it for any amount of money. I wouldn't trade the life I have now for anything because every time I get out of the boat, you are there right there with me, God. So God, I pray that if there's anybody here this morning who needs to get out of the boat, who needs to do something, take a step of faith, challenge something, forgive somebody, pray for a miracle, pray for a healing, take a, a bold step of faith. If there's anybody here who has not been bold, who's known more for their party than for their passion for you, God, I pray that we would also be people to confess that this morning. That we would recognize that God wants, wants to, that you want to be the center of our lives, God. So if we need to confess this morning, help us to do that. Help us to be bold and challenge our friends to be people who love you more. Help us to put you first. God, I believe in a miracle for this church. I believe in a miracle in my own lives, and I believe you're going to do miracles throughout this year. I love you, Jesus. God, if you are real, call me to do great things. I love you. Amen.